It's really exciting to speak to an audience that is actually interested in the things we do because, believe it or not, much of the scientific community don't like us very much for the reasons you saw in the previous talk. We're a bit disruptive. So, like um, many of the physicists of my generation, uh, we, we got very excited with the word nanotechnology when we were at university. So, I moved to Japan to do my PhD, and, and I, I was very lucky to be with a bunch of scientists that, move, uh, that were very happy to work in this field. And the key at that time was that we were building the first microscopes that were able to see nature, to see matter at the nanometer scale, not only see it, but manipulating it. That was the beginning, I think, of nanotech. We could see nanometer scale objects. So the whole thing has evolved, like many of the, of the scientists of my generation started to study material sciences of nanoparticles and small materials, how to make them, what is the physics of them. But slowly we realized that the most interesting part was the interface with biology. Because biology happens at the nanometer scale. The real nanotech, the best nanotech we have, is the nanotech that biology has evolved over millions of years. Your DNA, your, nano, your proteins are nanoscale objects. Now, like I said, many of us have been building machines to be able to manipulate and, uh, and look at the matter at the nanometer scale, and we wanted to move our microscopes, our tools, to the biology lab. So we moved to the biology lab, and we started to see if we could find ways to see actually the functioning of the proteins, the functioning of your DNA inside your body, because those are the, the most interesting nanomachines. Uh, up to then, the biochemists, the biologists, what have been doing is to identify them, to give them names, to find the DNA, to find out what they do. But we, the physicists, with our new tools, could see how they work, learn from them, and in turn fabricate the new nanotechnology. So that convergence of nanotechnology and biology that has been predicted for a very long time it's actually starting to happen. We're living in very exciting times in my field. We've been facing a very, a a very opposition even from biologists, from biochemists, to have these new paradigms, these new thoughts, bringing them to biology, but it's starting to happen. And it's happening in the lab, and I'm gonna bring you some news from the lab, and it's starting to happen in new products, new companies. So I'll try to tell you what is happening now. So this image, for example, is an example we see these days in conference in biology. This, before, in biology, when you studied maybe at a school, the cell was something like this, a cartoon with a lot of things in it. A static, a static, poor biochemists had to spend really, and very ingenious biochemists were finding out ways of identifying all these bits in it, electron microscope, but it was always dead, it was always difficult, we didn't know how they interact with each other. These days, with something we call super resolution fluorescent microscopy, we're starting to illuminate the cell inside. We're able to put labels that are colored inside the proteins we are studying, and we can study the cell inside as it moves alive. And, and this is the real biology. And from there, for me, what is more exciting is to use these new microscopes. This is from my lab. This is made with an atomic force microscope to go even down and down and down in the level of resolution and start to study, for example, DNA. Does the DNA you see in the pictures of the biology books, a cartoon? But DNA is not a cartoon. DNA moves. DNA has a lot of physics. It's inside your chromosome in very complicated shapes. And it's not only the genes. Everybody will talk about DNA and genes. Only 2% of your DNA is genes. The rest, we don't know. Biologists said it was junk DNA. Physicists said it's impossible. This is giving it that shape, that movement is what makes the genes to be expressed. This, this is what you are, is the mechanics of that DNA interacting with each other. And with our tools, we're starting to prove it. We're trying to, to starting to see how your genes are expressed. And it's not only chemistry, it's physics. And this is when we collide with establishment. The establishment calls that epigenetics these days, and it's still chemistry. And we say it's physics and it's chemistry. It's more complicated. We need to integrate the sciences to understand the biology. And nanotechnologists, we're very integrative. We're very open. And that's why I love our community. This, for example, is a potassium channel. These are tiny things. These are two, three nanometers across. And it has a little hole, a pore of one nanometer in the middle. That pore selects potassium over sodium. These pores are necessary for your health, the health of your cells. 
when you have too much salt and you don't have enough potassium, you have problems, you have diabetes, you have a lot of problems. And it's because of that tiny pore that is able to select potassium over sodium. We don't know how it does it, and we're learning how to do it with these new techniques. Um, and not only we get static images, we get movies. We know how they move. We started to create microscopes that is showing you this is bacterial dopsin, a kind of homologue of the proteins you have in the back of your eye. We start to see how they open, how they close, how they react to light. We start in study, starting to study biology like we study physics. And that may be for you as a conceptual thing, but uh, you know, physics, biologists, what do they do? But the physics, what it tries to is to explain how it works. And a, branch, a, a typical physicist mind is once you learn, you make something with it. You make transistors you did in the past, you did material science. What I will show you is that our generation might be able to start to build a new, completely new class of materials, a completely new class of biology, and a new medicine. Uh, as I said, we don't only look how protein looks, like, for example, it's interesting for biologists or for medics, but we try to learn how our proteins work to construct new materials. Here at the top is a fantastic nanomachine that you have in your body that is able to produce the energy of your body. It's the ATP synthase. It's a rotary motor. There are two motors running on this. You have lots of them in every one of your cells. It produces kilograms of ATP, which is a molecule you need to function a day. Actually, 60 kilograms a day of ATPs. They build these things. It started by complicated electron structures, and now we can see them moving. We can start to see how we create nanomachines that rotate, how we create nanomachines that are able to produce energy at the nanometer scale. These are tiny, tiny things. And in the future, we hope we will be able to, think, to make these things to power devices, but they won't be made of silicon. That's my idea. We will make kind of bio, nano, analogs of all these things, because I think Biology happens in water not by chance, and probably our most sophisticated technology may have to work in water. These are the philosophical and physical problems that we encounter. Here, for example, we have a protein that walks. Can you see it walking up and down? This is a myosin. You have them in all your body, and it's a, it's, it's a protein that this is funny how the body works, but actually the matter when you're building a body and you're building and rebuilding all the time or, or from, from embryos to a big body, you need to transfer matter all over the place. And funnily enough, the body sometimes does it like that by walking and carrying big balls of trafficking through your, through your, through your cells. The interesting thing is how it does it. It's using the heat of your body to move. All these machines use heat to move. They are in something called the thermal fluctuation. And we're trying, by learning how they work, we learned how to utilize heat. And heat is everywhere. So you can see the normal sources of energy we're also trying to get out of here. So this is a bit the summary. I put here nanomedicine, but it could be nanobiology. Thus, we are at this interface. We're at the interface where we are starting to be able to manipulate inorganic matter better and better and better, use this inorganic matter to learn about biology, and then learn about biology to fabricate new matter. So this is an interplay of many disciplines. This is a kind of new nanomaterial science, biology, physics, everything merges. So like in the previous talk, I also talk about new paradigms. For example, I'll give you some examples of my lab and things we've done. Oh, that was my timer. I don't know how I am. OK. Um, for example, up to now in the 20th century, all the pharmaceutical companies were developing drugs always based on chemistry. The idea that you have a molecule that binds usually a membrane protein and cures your disease. They forgot that a body is much more than chemistry. And again, I'm talking a lot about mechanics here. And so us, the, the people that are from now technology, we had tools that are able to, move, to measure how soft and hard things are for the first time at the nanometer scale in the cell uh, scale. So we said, obviously, our body, our cells, stem cell researchers are, are finding this more and more complicated to harness this. We feel forces. It's not only chemistry. The forces that we feel, every cell of your body, I talked before about DNA. DNA is an enormous molecule. You have two meters of DNA inside your cell. And it's feeling these forces. And it's these forces that brings the chemistry. It's what we call mechanochemistry, right? So now we're making for the first time the tools to move to measure these forces, which is not an easy thing. We have to create 
new physics for understanding this process. By doing this, for example, we've been able, this is a bacterium, a picture of a bacterium with atomic force microscope, and by hitting it with these clever nano cantilevers, we are able to make a map of the stiffness of a bacterium, how soft. You may think this is just funny and, and not very interesting, and we can also do it for cells, <coughs> like human cells. But for example, my colleague Sonia Trigueros at the University of Oxford, with these ideas, have fabricated a new nanoparticle that is, is able to make bacteria explode. And you may say, oh, this is just funny for explosion. No, remember we have a, pro <laughs> remember we have a problem with antibiotic resistance. All our current antibiotics are based on a paradigm which is to basically mimic or copy the molecules that fungi produce to kill bacteria. But bacteria have always evolved over millions of years with fungi to survive these antibiotics. So what is happening? We're running out and we have a scarce every two weeks in the press. Uh, so what do we do? The traditional establishment of biology is telling us, give us money to keep doing the same. And they're giving money to do the same. It's probably fine. I, I'm, I'm not against fine, uh, research in any direction. What we nanotechnologists are saying is, why don't we think this differently? We can find nanoparticles that make bacteria break. Nanoparticles, uh, bacteria have not evolved with nanoparticles in the environment. It's, gonna, it's like so, bacteria, and they break them in an explosive way, it's also very useful. It's a bit like, bacteria never grew uh, resistant to soap, because when soap hits them, it explodes them, and, and it's, it's too massive, the damage, and they cannot, they cannot survive. The problem is we cannot drink soap to kill the bacteria when we have infection. So, but with clever nanoparticles, we can create a kind of novel antibiotic that defeats resi uh, antibiotic resistance. Things, this way of thinking, for example, is helping colleagues and all over the world to try a, for new drug delivery systems for cancer. Cancer, of course, the first idea, and this is why we get the funding, is just to say we're going to do the same thing that the doctors do. We just say to get the funding because we say we're going to do something different. They, they, they will never give us money to try and do it, but actually we're doing something different. Um, so basically, to keep everybody happy, we put in nanoparticles the same things that doctors do, and we say we just create a clever bullet that will find the target your um, tumor, and it will explode there, releasing chemotherapy drugs. And that's, that's, that's a starting to be made. It's difficult to target, but I think we, we should try and go a bit farther, and we try to find out other ways of killing cancer, but understand their tumors, the mechanics of tumors, the physics. Of the, of the veins, of the, of the fluids that go in your body. And particularly interesting is the EPR effect. So, so when you create a tumor, the veins become more porous. And we're creating nanoparticles that gain through this porosity, which are stiffer, and they can reach much better the tumor. The first products are already in the market, and they've been approved, FDA approved last year. So we, we're starting to move towards this. We'll, we still have a long way to go, but that this is getting quite exciting. Other things that nanotechnologists are starting to have products in the market is, of course, bi nanosensing, biosensing. So the idea, the holy grail is get a drop of blood, put it in a little strip, I tell you everything about your blood. This is not easy. You can see it everywhere we will do it. We'll do this enormous technological challenges to do this. Biological, technological, but we're getting closer. We're getting closer to this. And we start to see the first products, contact lenses that Monitor glucose are, maybe they're going to be in the market soon. This is a strange product. I'm not sure what it can be used for, but it's quite interesting. So basically, they put a little circuit in your tooth to detect bacteria. <coughs> See, I suppose it's to help you to control the hygiene of your teeth. This is an interesting company has come out in the States recently that is getting a lot of money recently for research, <coughs> which is... Uh, they put these little strips there. It's a bit the test I was telling you of the blood test. You put a drop of blood and you get a lot of things. These people are doing it with gold nanoparticles, but I tell you, this is a different thing. So what you do is to buy their machine, and their machine has these little cartridges here, and each of them is testing for a different thing. So still, you're still far from the super mega clever patch that will know everything about your blood, but we get in there. Maybe 2025 is a bit early. Uh, because, yeah, science goes slowly, many things, and I think some of the fundamental things we're going to find in biology is going to be like physics and astrophysics, you know, some problems are very difficult to tackle, and I think biology is going to give us a wealth of difficult problems to tackle, which is fun. This is the, 
this is my, the, the, the project that I'm more interested in and I think is one of the areas that is more interesting for me, which is re regenerating tissue. Um, you know, you have a lot of uh, stem cell research usually made by biologists that put lots of chemistry and they can grow skin and we're having a lot of, a lot of very good success in this area recently. But I think the research should be deeper and, more, uh, and fundamentally more interesting. So, your tissues in your body are getting a lot of signals, chemical and as I said before, mechanical, which is a lot of stem cell researchers are forgetting. Your cells, which are these little balls, are inside a mesh of nanoscale strings, which is your extracellular tissue. These strings, which is, your, is, is giving them all the signals of the cells to be the way they are. So when you, have, uh, when you want to regenerate tissue from stem cells, you need to give the stem cells the right signals through some kind of extracellular matrix to create a brain or create whatever you want. And also when you have you know, a wound, the problem is that you have a scars because you lose this information. So the cells don't know how to fit in the right place and you have scary tissue. So what we're trying to do these days in the lab is to create a extracellular, artificial extracellular matrix or what we call biomimetic extracellular matrix materials that are hybrids between biology and, and, nano, and, and nano materials to start to be able to give cells those signals so we can regenerate tissue and eventually what we're going to do, I don't know, in 2025, probably much longer, is to be able to control biological matter. We will be able to create and even to create new cells. Once we learn how to give signals to cells and turn cells into whatever we want, you can see the amount of possibilities we have there. We have a new material science, but it's a a very different material science. You might be creating intelligent materials. So a lot of thinking to do in this area as well. Better for now, I mean, I think for 2025, we probably will have patches that help to heal spinal cord injuries. Um, we already have them in the labs. You know, the problem is when you have a, a, an injury that breaks your spine is that neurons don't communicate anymore. But we have learned that neurons can communicate if we put a patch with carbon nanotubes in them because carbon nanotubes are electrically conductive and neurons are able to grow connections into this and they start to communicate again. A number of labs are working in this and making these patches and it works. So I, the only thing is you have to make them biocompatible things you can put in your body and don't give you toxicity, et cetera, et cetera. But I think these are problems that can be overcome. And, and I think by 2025, we will have patches for fixing some of the spinal cord injuries and other nervous problems. Of course, um, that opens the way of, of, of many other things, which is wiring, wiring with neurons is always exciting, and we will see what will happen in the future about that. Other things that are happening in the lab is, for example, using these materials to train your immune system to kill cancer. This has been done in the Muni lab in Harvard. So basically, inside this little porous material, tiny pores, nanoscale material, they put signals to make the immune system of your body think that your cancer cells are some kind of invas invasive thing, like a bacteria, and go there and eat your cancer. So all this interplay between material science, chemistry, physics is starting to happen. I mean, many medics are not interested in this way of thinking, but I think it will happen anyway, because if you can create an implant that cures some types of cancer, they will cure them and it will be successful regardless of the opposition of, of the different communities. Again, we have um, new materials for regenerating bone, uh, creams that are starting to be delivered, basically vaccines are starting to be delivered by the skin. It's a still a big problem and many of the farmers are interested in how do we cross the skin with nanomaterials because the skin is a great barrier for nanomaterials. And it's not clear we can, we, how we can uh, cross all the way down through, but we're getting better. Um, well, and, and that's the last thing, which is, is not medical, but I think it's in the other interface that we're learning from biology to apply to other fields. It's in the field of quantum computing. I don't know if you've heard of this, but a lot of excitement in physics departments these days goes in quantum computing, using entanglement to, to communicate. And indeed, I think, one of the main sources of inspiration for this research will come from plants and biological systems. In recent years, there have been found structures, protein structures in plants that work in entanglement at high temperature. So we don't know why, we don't know how 
physics, uh, biology is using quantum mechanics to survive. This is a new area that we, we still need to explore. But the new first examples are being found. We have quantum entanglement in biological systems, and this will bring, I'm sure, a lot of inspiration to quantum computing. So just some numbers of what is going on. Most of the companies, this will be commercial research, most of the companies in this area are in the United States, in the area of Boston, and uh, I mean, basically surrounding the big uh, uh, academic institutions. These ideas come out of Harvard, MIT mainly. The UK has a little bit of presence, not much. France has increased a lot, the number of companies in nanotechnology. <laughs> and Germany is, is the second player after the United States. And of course, in Asia, is Japan because, and, and Korea increasingly, and China because they're investing so much in this. Uh, one worrying trend, and this is a bit the, well, the caution of the whole story, is the number of nanotech, bio, nanobiotech companies has been increasing, and then now it's decreasing. Uh, and why is that? Um, well, it's normal that some of the companies that were established because they were a bit primitive just don't, don't succeed in the market. The problem is we're not creating as many companies as we should. Because, uh, sadly enough, most of the scientists in our field have to leave because there's no, sun, no funding for our ideas. And another interesting graph here is that if you see, uh, did I put this? Yeah, the multinational corporation entry into this is almost none. Big companies are not interested in this. They see us as uh, something very risky. There are problems for them about, the, they're afraid of insurance. These things are potentially very toxic. So it's only left to small companies to develop the new project. So the governments are, invest are investing, but not so much in research. And big companies are not investing almost at all. They're just looking. I, I get people to talk to us you know, from the big farmers and say, we're very interested in what you do, but we don't want to do anything. Uh, they just keep very small labs about it, just to know enough. So that's, that's a bit the story I wanted to tell you. Uh, so I finish with this slide. Uh, is current research about these companies and how it's working. And this, they, they, their research recommends a strong system of education, uh, transportation to create your industries, and a star scientists at research universities, which should be funded to create the new industry. So I hope I convince you, I think in this audience I don't need much convincing to do, that the future of medicine and biology will be very much linked to the future of physics and nanotechnology. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, we've got time for a few questions. I'm actually going to ask one myself. I'm going to, I'm going to use my privilege. And uh, um, we hear a lot about sort of exponential improvements in technologies. Um, the tools that you're working with are they getting better as fast as you want them to? Oh or no! Expect them to? This is a very interesting story, and usually with a lot of heroes working in interesting places. No. The basic tools are not getting better. They are getting better slowly. Usually, uh, for example, the atomic force microscopes are getting better because of a bunch of quite crazy and excellent physicists working in a company in Santa Barbara called Asylum Research, which I work with. Just the name of the company tells you about. It's been recently bought by Oxford Instruments, so I don't know what is going to happen about that. But I mean, the technology doesn't evolve so quickly because there's not so much demand. We're not so many people working on this. We don't get much funding. We are a threat to a lot of fields, and you know, it's very difficult for us to come to a res you know biologist and say, "Give us money to do something that is going to get you out of your job." <laughs> and as physicists, it's, it's a complicated story. Hello, Matt Kemp. Um, is the nano scale the final scale required to understand everything about life, or is there anything smaller? Yeah, well, um, I mean, that was my last, last slide about the quantum aspects of biology. I think we're reaching now the level that we can measure and look at the nanometer scale. And indeed, proteins, our fundamental processes, as li at least the chemical processes, work at the nanometer scale. Now, we're finding quantum effects in biology. And you know, probably there's a lot of speculation, you know, why do we need quantum in biology at all? Why do plants have quantum effects? Do we have quantum effects somewhere else in our body? How can we find that? How is that important for consciousness? This has always been a, 
uh, an idea that was put in the, I mean, in the 1990s, 1980s, uh, that, that human consciousness it might be linked to quantum processes. So if that's the case, we need to go down. We need to go down to the, the, to the, to the below nanometer scale. We still don't have the tools to explore these things, but we will have them. And, and that, that I guess this is the, the, the issue of the brain will come there. Hi. Hi, Mark Goodman, London Futurists. Um, quick question, just to go on about quantum, a little bit more about the quantum effects. So I thought, I, I read that uh, you need very low temperatures and you need, you don't, you can't have warm, squishy, wet environments, I believe, I, I heard. This is, this is the holy so grail can of you go into that a little bit more, please? Because uh, yeah, Dr. Hammeroff, because Dr. Hammeroff has uh, some interesting things to say about this as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not an expert in quantum computing, but if indeed, the, the, the few examples of entanglement that we have been able to create in, in physics lab have been at very low temperatures in very simple systems. That's why the experiment I showed you before that without any doubt proved that the photosynthetic complex in some plants and bacteria have quantum entanglement. Basically, the whole, the whole unit works as a whole. It was very surprising. We don't know why it needs it, how it does it. That's why I think it will be the inspiration for quantum computers because it can do it at uh, you know, 40 degrees. It's plant. How we do it, that's biology. Just that's, I guess it's all this business of... Um, mechanical coupling, chemical clever physics going on. Uh, hello, I'm Nicole Petschek, I'm an executive coach. I'd just like to know your call as a scientist on the um, placebo-nocebo effect on the regeneration in, and the regeneration of tissue. Placebo effect in Placebo-nocebo, both. Oof, I'm, I'm not really sure, I have thought a lot about this. Placebo effect, plac I'm not sure I understand what is the placebo effect in regenerating. The, 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 the consciousness of a belief on the regeneration okay. of a tissue. That it will, it will work. Yes. We don't know. I don't study this. I mean, this is the problem of the brain. We don't know how far the brain goes. We don't have tools to study these things. Mr. Rohit. Sonia, down here. Um, Rohit Talwar, futurist. Um, in the same way as uh, in China, you know, people didn't know what they were doing with the genome. Yeah. And then in four years, Beijing yeah. genomic sciences dominated yeah, genome mapping. Where do you think they are in, in terms of nanotechnology? Because when you go to things like AAAS and some of the other big conferences, all Chinese. most of the Chinese people you Chinese meet are working Korean. in something yeah. that could be described yeah. as nanotech. There's an enormous amount of money being thrown into nanotech in China. I mean, enormous, more than anywhere else. And there's an enormous amount of scientists. I get a lot of students from Beijing University. The sad thing is most of the best students go, they're actually doing their nanotech in the States. So now the, the thing is, once they complete the whole circle and they start to bring them back, I think the things will get very exciting. Some of them go back. There's a lot of problems, social problems, in surviving as a scientist in China. China is a complicated society for entrepreneurs and in, for scientists. But of course, I mean, just the amount of people, how hard they work, and the money they put in, it will happen, like it happened in Japan. You know, Japan did it after the war. China will do it. One last question for this session. Quick one, uh, gentleman of the white up there. Hi, I'm Tom Griffiths. I'm interested in healthcare technology. And um, you, you mentioned um, blowing up bacteria, mm -hmm. which sounds awesome. I just, um, obviously one of the- we can always squeeze them with one by one and make them burn. <laughs> <laughs> Quite fun. One, one, of the, <coughs> one of the crises, obviously, facing, facing healthcare is the continued use of antibiotics produces continually more, more or stronger bacteria. Yeah. But not just bacteria, but also, obviously, bacterial spores, uh, mycobacteria, awesome. all sorts of things. Uh, I'm just, I was just wondering if this technology is... You know, if there is an application in that field, how long do you think before I we think can stop using antibiotics and replace them with this kind of technology? This is one of the fields that I think could be done relatively quickly if we find a way to do it. So my colleague at Oxford, um, Sonia, is working with a lot of people trying to move this forward. Uh, interestingly, most of the collaborators she's having are in developing countries because one interesting thing happens in this field is that countries that don't have a pharmaceutical industry that is hitting governments to say what they should do, 
like Korea. Korea doesn't have a pharmaceutical industry, and this is very interesting. Japan does, but Korea doesn't. And China doesn't have a pharmaceutical Brazil, and funny enough, Cuba, are very interested in all these things. So my colleague collaborates with scientists in, this, in these countries to bring forward this. And I think it will work. We, the problem is, you know, to get these things, you need a lot of tests, to, to the toxicity, et cetera. So it's a time-consuming thing and that you can approve. You know, it takes 10 years to bring it to the market or more. But I think it won't be coming through the traditional routes. This is not going to be Merck or Pfizer. So it's also exciting. It might come from Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you.